I want to show you a quick video as requested by you guys the viewers on how to make char cloth. Now you may have two questions. One, why char cloth? Two, why is he sitting in his backyard to make it? If you think about the fire triangle you need fuel, heat, and air. Well essentially you're taking fuel in the form of cotton material, linen material, muslin material, and you're placing that inside a container. Uh, in this case we're going to use metal containers. So you're placing it inside a container to create an anaerobic environment. So um, what you're doing is applying heat to that and then you're forcing through heat you're forcing all the impurities out and what you're left with is you know from cotton material with you know uh, all kinds of dyes and it, 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 uh, all kinds of dyes, etc., and you're left with just raw carbon at that point. Uh, and that carbon is ready to take the heat from any ignition source that you use. So, um, traditionally, it's used with uh, traditional, you know, flint and steel techniques, and it's great for that, but it also makes any other ignition source that you're using that much easier. What it does is, is it takes a cool spark from traditional flint and steel. A hot spark from a ferro rod really well. If you think about it, these are about 800 degrees Fahrenheit. These are about 5,500 degrees Fahrenheit. So these will work with a variety of tenders. Flint and steel, you need kind of a specialized tender to go with. Um, so, but anyway, uh, if you're using those, it's great for that. It's great for solar if you know the conditions allow for that, which they don't really allow for that. I don't think right now lighters you know it's kind of redundant for a lighter but you know if you're trying to conserve fuel uh, or if you have a broken lighter like this one you know that's just throwing off a spark I can still use this charred material to accept that spark and it'll take off rather easily and I'll show you that here in a second so anyway let's take a look at some of these ignition sources using charred material what we're trying to do here we're trying to create an ember and that ember we're going to place into a bird's nest tender bundle. And if you haven't seen my video on building a basic tender bundle, you want to go back and check that out because this will make a lot more sense to you. So essentially I'm getting this to catch a spark, creating an ember with it, placing it in that tender bundle, and then I'm blowing that to flame. So let's look at some of this charred material that I have in here, char cloth. And use it with several different methods. Of ignition. Let's start with traditionally what it was made for was traditional flint and steel and it works really well for that. If you can see that going, try to stoke that up a little bit for you. Once that's gone, I can place that inside a tinder bundle and I can blow that to flame. So traditional flint and steel. Um, if you have something like, and that's a cool spark, if you have something that throws a hot spark, like this ferro rod, you know, you don't have to really get into it. All you need is a little flick of that ferro rod to get this going. I can set that out there and just give it a little flick. And you can see this is burning in about in different places. Place that in my tinder bundle and I'm ready to go. Alright, so it just takes a little bit of that resource. You can tell how much I scraped off. I got plenty of rod there left. So really it extends the use of, of your, your tools, especially things that take fuel or that are not renewable, you know, like the solar is. Um, I don't think I have a spot to be able to show you the solar today, but it, it literally takes seconds. Um, I might be able to move and show you that here in a second, but let's say like if I had a lighter that's broken, well, because it's only taking a spark to get that going, this is a miniature ferro rod. So, you know, 5,000 plus degree spark comes from that. Anyway, even a broken lighter can be useful
but that allows you to use a broken lighter. Because the conditions are not good enough to do solar right now, what I'll do is I'll include using char cloth in a future video on solar ignition uh, so you guys can see just how quickly that happens. I mean, it's, it's three to five seconds you hit it with that light. Uh, if you've got good sunlight and you have the ability to use that, and that allows you to save the rest of your resources. So, having said that, I want to transition to the second question. Why is he making it in his backyard and not in the field? Well, the answer to that is char cloth and using tins are something that you do when you're back in the rear before you go out into the field. Um, I'm not an advocate of carrying additional cotton material with me to the woods so that I can then turn it into char cloth once I get there. Um, but I'll make that before I go out so that when I'm carrying this tin that I was going to use out in the field it already has charred material in it and then what I'll do is I'll replenish this supply from nature when I'm out in the field. So char cloth is very much a a uh, kind of a subdivision bushcraft kind of thing if you want to look at it like that. It's, it's something that you do before you go out and you carry that with you. Just like you know cotton, linen, muslin is natural material, I can also use shredded barks, I can also use punk wood, I can use a number of things. I can use tinder, I can use uh, tinder fungus, I can use pithy stalks. There's so many things that I can use in the wild that's all around me. It doesn't make sense for me to carry cotton material or sacrifice clothing or some other article of, of gear that I took with me like a, like a bandana that I could use for something else just doesn't make any sense to me so um, I'll make char cloth out of scraps while I'm back here in the rear and I'll carry that with me but when I'm replenishing this supply it's going to be charred tinder charred natural tinder that I'm going to use and that'll be the next video in this series so that is why I'm making it here in the backyard so next question how do you make it? All right. What I like to do is I'm going to use um, just normally like these pants are about to be char cloth. Uh, what I'll do is I'll cut, you know, probably about two inch by two inch squares of denim. Denim's my preferred. Uh, denim or canvas, as long as it's 100% cotton, uh, that's my preferred thing to use for char cloth because the end result is a little more durable. Uh, you can use old ratty t-shirts, you know, whatever. Uh, but the end result, the end product you come out with is a little more flimsy uh, and fragile. So I prefer to use the denim. Uh, you can also use, you know, something as simple as cotton balls. You can char cotton balls. Uh, another thing that works really well is these big long rolled gauzes. Uh, if I've cut myself or, or if I'm using this to bandage something, I normally don't use, you know, all 3.6 yards. You know, this is, this is a lot of gauze but it's also no longer sterile after I open it. So what I'll do is I'll take the remainder of that, stuff it in a tin, and I'll char that, and it makes excellent charred material. The tins that we use, my favorite thing to use is just this, uh, this uh, tuna can right here, and this has got a lot of use. Uh, you can see it's got a lot of stuff on it. A lot of the impurities. But, uh, what this is, is a, one of the larger tuna cans after I ate the tuna, I saved it because this is a big compartment. I'm not carrying this with me in the field. Uh, this is just something that I'm charring back here. Uh, a lot of times you'll see me carrying this in my belt kit, my fire kit, and this actually has a screw top lid. And that's got some charred, uh, I believe that's aspen bark in there actually. Uh, so charred natural material, that's what I made in the field. Uh, and then you got, you know, kind of the hinged tins, the Altoid style tins that a lot of people like to carry. Uh, and this has got, you know, char cloth and it's got some charred punk on it in as well. So all of it works the same. But anyway, a note, a lot of videos that you see are going to tell you that you need to poke a hole in the lid and it needs to be a small pinhole. Um, you can see the size of the hole in that tuna can lid. And what I found is, you know, when I first made this, um, I really didn't need the hole because enough kind of gets out and and with this one I actually used one of those uh, uh, can openers that remove the edge because the lid actually fits on there a little bit better so it can snug down poke a little hole in the top it doesn't have to be a pinhole you just poke a hole in the top to allow gases to escape um, and when it's superheated the gases are going to be pushing out at such a rate that that no air is going to get back in there because if air gets back in there then it'll cause it to combust 
uh, it'll actually catch because then you've completed the fire triangle going back to what I started to say about taking away the heat you know putting the fuel inside creating an anaerobic environment so that you can make this char cloth uh, because this one has a screw top you definitely need to poke a hole in it because the gases have to be able to escape um, these Altoid style lens they've got hinges on the back a lot of times the gases will escape there there's no reason uh, no need to put an additional hole in that so today I'm just going to use my tuna can because that's what I like to use and these other ones already have material in them and I'm going to use my trusty MSR pocket rocket stove I've got my stove and I've got my tuna can I'm just going to take some denim pieces just kind of loosely throw them in there you don't want to overpack this overcrowd it because you want to char all the way around the material uh, not just the top and bottom layer so usually I found with a big old tuna can like this I can put about 10 squares in here throw the lid on I'll seal it up as best I can because I've got that vent hole on top the gases are still going to escape around the sides it's not a big deal but I want to create as anaerobic an environment as possible get my stove fired up might be a little loud here in a second I'm going to cook that for a couple of minutes. You're going to watch as this is going. You're going to see that gases are going to start escaping. It's going to come out in like a white smoke. And there it is right there. This whole process takes about two to three minutes. So once that really starts rolling, a lot of that is moisture right now. So if I try to light it, it won't light because all the water, all the moisture is being pushed out. But after a while, this stuff gets to be some pretty, you know, pretty volatile gas and I don't really want the smoke so I'll burn that off might be a little too much gas I'm gonna turn that down because the force is actually putting it out Still a lot of moisture in there. Anyway, I'll let that moisture come off in there a little bit longer. Once it gets to a gas, I'll light that and it'll actually burn it as it comes out. That does two things for me. That, that cuts down the amount of smoke that's coming out. But it also gives me an indication as to when gases are no longer escaping, the little flame will go out. So it's kind of like a little pilot light that tells me when it's done. may be too windy we may not get to do that anyway do this outside don't do it indoors um, Obviously, this is some pretty nasty gases coming off. You can see it burns. One of the gases is being pushed out is oxygen and nitrogen. So I've got kind of my pilot light going there. I'm just going to keep watching it until that light goes out and the gases stop escaping and then I know it's pretty much done. If the wind doesn't blow it out. Like that. Uh oh. Two is one, one is none, right? there cuts down on the smoke all right so it's starting to can't the uh, light is starting to actually go down a little bit now so what I like to do is kind of give it a shake without opening the lid just kind of agitate it just a little bit that way I can kind of open up some air pockets in there between the layers of denim 
and make sure I get a complete cook. So it's not taking a flame anymore. There's a little bit of smoke coming off it still. It's no longer taking a flame. Yeah, a little bit. I'll crank up the heat, make sure I've pushed out any of it. A little bit of flame left there. So I'll crank up the heat, make sure that I've got all the impurities pushed out of that. Agitate it a little bit. But as long as it still takes that pilot light, I know that there's impurities being pushed out of that. And I want to get all of those out. So I'm just going to wait until it no longer does that. And then I'm going to turn it off and let it cool. not taking a flame anymore so it's probably pretty much done what I'm gonna do is shut that off I'm gonna let it cool uh, keep in mind this is very hot um, I'm gonna let it cool and I'm gonna make sure I don't open a lid because if I open the lid while it's still hot then that introduces air into the fire triangle uh, because I've got superheated fuel in here already in an anaerobic environment so introducing air at this point will cause it to flame up and your char cloth will be ruined so let that cool come back we'll open it up I always test a piece and uh, store the rest so be back in a minute all right so this is basically cooled to the touch so let's take a look at how it looks all right that looks pretty good I've got nice black sheets of char cloth if they were brown then I know it wasn't completely cooked. And I could just put them right back in and continue to cook them and, and make sure I crank up the heat and continue to burn that gas off the top so I have that indicator of when it's done. But this is nice and you can see the denim is not all that fragile but it rips apart. So you can imagine you know a thinner material how easy that is to rip apart. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll test a piece of this make sure that the batch is good and I'll test it with the coolest ignition source I have, which is traditional flint and steel. Hopefully you can see that, but that's a successful batch. So then I'll take that char cloth, transfer it over, and this is what I'll carry to the field. Hey everybody, this is Josh here, the Great Breed of Green Beret. And it has always been my goal to connect with people and teach them skills to help them get further down the road towards being more and more self-reliant. For those of you that are serious about your self-reliance training, you want to get more access, I recommend you join me today as a GB2 member over on my website, greatbreedgreenbrain.com slash membership. Every member is going to get an exclusive subdued GB2 member patch, a numbered members only GB2 logo blacked out coin, and all members are going to get 20% off store-wide all the time. So it'll be like Black Friday every day for members. You're going to get access to a members only video and content library. In addition, you're going to get free access to all the courses that I put up on the GB2 Distance Learning Center and a bi-weekly members only live Q&A session. And if that's still not enough, you're also going to be automatically entered 
into a monthly members only giveaway. Join me as an official GB2 member. Go to greatbreedofgreenberet.com slash membership. We'll get your exclusive patch and number coins out the door immediately and you can start saving today.